preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. It's my pleasure to be here uh, introducing our speaker in the second lecture in this, our second year of what we hope will be a very long-standing cooperative venture between the Archaeological Institute, which last year also got a $500,000 challenge grant from NEH, and the 92nd Street Y. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Barry Kunliff, and um, this is one of the rare opportunities, I guess, when I'm introducing someone when I can literally say that he needs no introduction, because we were all here last week to hear what a superb archaeological lecturer he is and what a fine job he can do illuminating and elucidating the rather complicated history of later first millennium BC Europe. Um, but in fact, without requiring an introduction, it's still a pleasure to give Dr. Quinlan an introduction because he is so multifaceted and such an expanded practitioner of archaeology. He is a major and well-known scholar in the best academic tradition. He was educated at St. John's College in Cambridge. He's taught at the University of Bristol and at the University of Southampton. Um, and then in 1972, made that hardest of British archaeological transitions for a Cambridge man. He moved to Oxford, where he assumed the chair of European archaeology and where he teaches today. Excavations he has directed include the excavations at the Villa Palace at Fishbourne, at the site of Bath, which we heard much about last week and which has been the main focus of his fieldwork since the 1960s, and at the Iron Age Hill Fort at Danbury. In 1979, Dr. Cunliffe became a fellow of the British Academy. In addition to being a traditional scholar, Barry Cunliffe is also a major contributor to archaeology as an organizer, synthesizer, and administrator. He has made major contributions to archaeology through his symposia on Iron Age Europe that he organized during the last decade at Oxford, and the symposium volumes that he edited for the British Archaeological Reports series. He has served on the British Ancient Monuments Board. He served as president between 1976 and 79 for the Council for British Archaeology. And then finally, in addition to being a scholar and an administrator, Barry Cunliffe is also an innovative popularizer of archaeology, the leading force in the use of radio and television to spread the gospel of archaeology to the general public. Last week, we heard him lecture on Celtic gods in Roman guise. I should add one other thing about Barry Cunliffe in that greatest of all academic debates involving European prehistory. He comes down as far as I believe entirely on the side of the angels. Tonight, we will not hear about him speaking of the European Celts, as some people confusedly do, but instead hear him pronouncing that hard K the way I think that it absolutely should be, talking about the Celts and the Romans. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Barry Cunliffe, who will lecture on slaves, wine, and the Roman conquest. Dr. Cunliffe. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, last week, when we were looking at uh, Celtic religion and the effects of Celtic religion on the Romanization of, of Britain, the uh, religion coming through into the provinces, um, I tended to concentrate uh, on the simple theme of religion and upon uh, the, the simple interaction between Celt and Roman. Now, uh, part of my brief when I was asked to give these lectures was to um, bring in a certain amount of methodology to show how the archaeologist works. And I think after uh, last week, which uh, I, I regard as a, a fairly gentle introduction, you, you might not, but uh, I, I thought it was a, a reasonably gentle introduction. Um, this week, um, I want to uh, take a, a, a single theme, which I think is manageable and understandable and interesting, uh, and to show how an archaeologist approaches that theme. Uh, so there will be a certain amount of archaeological reasoning and archaeological thought and presentation going into the, the, uh, the, the um, process of this lecture. Now, uh, the storyline is very simple. Um, it is barbarian Europe, and I should be concentrating mainly on France and Britain, uh, occupied by Celts, occupied by a fairly primitive form of barbarian community, um, and the way in which Rome imposes itself, or the classical world, I should say, imposes itself upon that barbarian community. Now, not in terms of military control and military advance, uh, but in terms of the bow wave effect of um, softening up 
the province, uh, what, what is to become the, the, the provinces of the Roman world, softening up this barbarian area uh, with um, infiltrations, economic infiltrations. So it's really this economic bow wave in advance of the moving army. So th that is our theme. And the, the theater in which we're going to work, as I say, is largely France from its Mediterranean fringe uh, up to Britain. Uh, but occasionally we'll, we'll expand out from that. May I have the first slide, please? Now, the Celts. Um, I haven't, I'm afraid, time to discuss Celtic society in any detail, although uh, and I shall make a number of points as we progress this evening. But uh, we know a great deal about the Celts as seen through the eyes of the Romans. The Romans, remember, who are always trying to interpret these barbarian peoples in a way in which um, the, the readership could understand. Um, we have texts like the text of, of Strabo um, or Diodorus Siculus, uh, people like that, who um, give us physical descriptions of the Celts. The Celts are war mad, we're told. They're easily stirred up to feats of enthusiastic battle and fighting, although they're not of evil character, as, as one Roman writer says. They are exuberant. Their art is exuberant. Um, then we have physical descriptions of them as a society and as, as a people, how powerful their women were, how tall some of them were, how they, they loved their physical appearance. Um, and whilst you're looking at these two kinds of Celtic faces, uh, descriptions, for example, telling us how the Celts often uh, brushed lime in their hair so that their hair would stand up and make themselves look more fierce where there are Celts with their hair standing up. And how they would take a great deal of trouble um, shaving their faces. And that the um, more aristocratic people would shave the whole of their faces apart from their upper lip. And they would grow long, droopy moustaches like the chap at the bottom there. And then there is a splendid description, a splendid account from Diodorus Siculus um, of um, how the moustache sometimes got in the way of eating and drinking. And uh, when they drank wine, they, as it were, filtered it through their moustaches. Um, but they come over through the eyes of the classical writers as a very human uh, people, boastful, noisy, exuberant, easy, easy to battle, easy to run away from battle, um, and a an heroic society with a vengeance. We'll come back uh, a little later to the, the kind of society. Uh, one could go on a very long time talking about the Celts, but that is strictly not my brief this evening. Now, what we're going to do then is to look at how successively, and I, I shall take a, a fairly simple chronological progression through this lecture, um, how progressively uh, the Roman world imposed upon the Celtic. Next slide, please. Now, if we go back to the 6th and 5th centuries BC, um, the classical um, imposition on barbarian Europe, and this is the part of Europe that we'll be talking about. Um, I'm not really going down into Spain very much. It's essentially France here, a bit of the Low Countries, and the whole of Britain. And if I could just introduce you to the, the, the key geography, the River Rhone here, the River Loire there, and the River Garonne here. Now, at this stage, um, there were the, the interface between the um, Mediterranean world and the barbarian world was a very narrow one, a very thin one along the fringes of France, what is now France, the Mediterranean coast of France. Marseille, traditionally founded at about 600 BC, although some people are arguing that it's a bit later now. Um, uh, various Greek cities, not all of them shown here, around to Epurion, uh, the market center, and Purias, as it now is, in Spain. And, and these cities were very much on the interface between the barbarian world on the one hand, barbarian inland Europe, and the Mediterranean world. And through them flowed products. Their, their entire function was to act as ports of trade in the archaeological jargon, places 
uh, which could articulate trade and could bring the commodities which the consuming world of the Mediterranean required from the producing world of barbarian Europe. And among those commodities, well, there were many, furs, amber, metals, manpower in terms of slaves and so on. Now, I don't want to talk terribly much about this particular period, this um, early period of Greek interfacing. But the archaeological record is very clear and uh, very well studied. Um, what seems to have happened is that, um, particularly in the 550s to 500, a major trading axis developed here from Marseille into central barbarian Europe, eastern France, Burgundy across to Bavaria and up into the mid-Rhine. And a little bit later, um, the impetus swapped over to this more easterly axis, the Etruscan world, into the Po Valley, and across through the Alpine passes into rather more eastern part of that zone. But the, the detailed chrono chronology doesn't concern us this evening. Uh, what is interesting, I think, is that in this barbarian area were a number of chief, chieftains who could manipulate the trade, and they were the middlemen, presumably, through whose hands passed all these commodities from the north down into the Mediterranean by its various routes. And they benefited. They developed what is um, archaeologically recognized as a prestige goods economy. In them, they maintained their power through the manipulation of prestige goods, which they acquired from the Mediterranean world. And uh, some of the burials were uh, very remarkable. Next, please. I just want to show one artifact from one of the burials. This is the famous crater from the burial at Vix in Burgundy, which um, I, I remember the statistic. It's 1.64 meters in height. <coughs> it doesn't mean very much. And I, I remember being absolutely staggered when I first saw it, how big 1.64 meters is. You could comfortably hide three people inside it. It's a huge, great wine-mixing crater purely Greek, or probably um, made in the uh, South Italian um, Greek schools, and taken apart and trundled up the Rhine, no doubt by boat, um, by river craft, um, as a, presumably a diplomatic gift. And it ended up in the burial of a, um, a female, very rich um, female burial in Vix. Now, this is one of the items uh, a diplomatic gift representing the wine-drinking ritual which the Mediterranean world was transshipping into the barbarian world and enabling the chieftains to maintain this display of prestige. Um, uh, it's a rather uh, overkill kind of object, and one of my classical colleagues said that no self-respecting Greek would be seen dead with a thing like this. Um, it very much is something ostentatious for the natives. Uh, rather than a work of art that a, a, a Greek would like to have around. Next, please. Well, uh, but that's by way of introduction. Now, um, let us um, explore what was happening to this um, southern French fringe in the, the next centuries. Uh, it's very well studied by French archaeologists. We know that a number of Greek colonies were founded, the squares, uh, all the way around this coast, and they um, maintained the trade. But inland from them uh, are all these circular spots, which are native, um, I think we must call them urban settlements. Although they are purely barbarian, they are outside the, the direct control of the Greek cities. Um, they were very classical in their style. They had uh, regular street grids, um, masonry building, masonry temples, and so on, uh, and were very much the middlemen, the barbarian middlemen, who were producing, uh, this is a very rich area of Provence, uh, producing a range of commodities which the Mediterranean consumers wanted, but they were also sitting on the fringes uh, of the, the trading networks which were coming in from outside. Uh, trading networks from the Cévennes and the Montagne Noire, which are uh, down here where metals were produced, and trading networks from much further afield. And we've only time this evening just to explore one of them, so I can show you how an archaeologist uh, looks at one of these. Next, please. Um, uh, 
this is simply to remind me, I don't want to argue it in any detail, simply to remind me to say that we do have good classical sources um, and we know quite a lot about the trade in this period because we have a couple of um, Greek sailors, someone who wrote the Massiliot Periplus, which is a sort of sailing manual, somewhere back or out before 500, and another chap, a, a Greek sailor called Pythias, who was writing in the 320s, both of whom sailed in these Atlantic waters and knew about the trade routes and recorded them as sailing manuals. They were probably ship's masters, Massiliot ship's masters. And um, their directions come down to us, admittedly through a very dubious manner. Um, the Massiliot Periplus appears eventually uh, in a 4th century AD Roman poem written in North Africa. But at least the, 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 the evidence is there, and we have times and routes and so on recorded. So we have a certain amount of classical evidence about these routes, and it's for the archaeologists to fill them out. Next, please. And here is just one of them, uh, the, the tin route, which um, interests us very much, because tin is a rare commodity. Uh, tin was only available from up here in Brittany and in the southern part of Britain, only easily available, I should add, at this stage. Uh, there's more done here. Um, and a regular route developed in this, this way. Now, one of the pieces of research which um, I'm carrying out with, with my colleagues in England is to explore a number of these ports of trade in Britain to look at the interface where the traders from ultimately the Mediterranean world um, corris um, corresponded with the natives in Britain and indeed in Brittany. So let's just explore a little bit of this tin route. Um, the dotted line is given us by the classical sources. Next, please. Now, um, it ends up, or starts, if you like, um, in Britain, in the southwest corner of Britain, in what is um, Cornwall and Devon, the counties of Cornwall and Devon. Uh, and I believe it starts um, at a place called Mount Batten, which is near Plymouth, for those of you who know that particular area. Um, this is a very important area because it's on the fringes of Dartmoor up here. Um, Dartmoor is a mineral-rich area, and a lot of tin was washed out of Dartmoor and found its way into the gravels of the rivers coming down into Plymouth Sound. And tin could be extracted from there uh, and um, uh, amassed in one of the best ports on the south coast where traders were interacting with it. Next, please. Um, this is, in fact, the site of Mount Batten. Uh, it's not a very prepossessing place now, unfortunately. Um, that, that is Mount Batten, and it's seen from Plymouth Hoe, uh, where um, traditionally Francis Drake played bowls when the Spanish Armada came across, and, and close to where, of course, the Mayflower left, um, finally left Britain. Um, uh, but it's a military base now, and extremely difficult to um, excavate, uh, not least because it's difficult to get permission to move into. Next, please. Now, some of the artifacts which one finds um, at Mount Batten um, are uh, alien to Britain. They are foreign. There is this little trilobate arrowhead, which is almost certainly Greek. Uh, there are these bracelets, uh, which are, I think, French. And, and certainly not British. So the artifacts point to the trade route. Next, please. And if we just take one of them, uh, this doesn't actually come from Mountbatten, but it's, it's very much like a Mountbatten one. This strange fibula uh, with um, a, a disc foot, which people used to call Iberian. Well, it most certainly isn't. Next, please. Um, here are a large number of them, and they all come from Aquitania, in Western France. Next, please. And uh, this just happens to be a distribution map of some of them, uh, astride what is part of this main routeway, the, um, uh, the river that leads from the area of Narbonne, past Carcassonne, to the Garonne Gironde estuary, which we know from the classical sources was the main tin route. So, in other words, uh, we can recognize artifacts from this area, uh, which are being dispersed along the route 
and ending up um, in Britain. We can also recognize bits of tin uh, from the site in Britain, which presumably were the main export out. And this is the raw material uh, which archaeologists have to play with to enliven the classical sources but, and to give it a sort of geographical reality and a chronological reality. Next, please. Now, um, our main theme, however, is um, wine and the relationship of wine to uh, this trading pattern. Um, you'll see in a moment why I introduced the tin route. That is a long-established route um, along the Western Atlantic, uh, which is maintained as a very important route for many centuries, as we shall see. Now, this, this is a part of the longer dock. This is really a holiday snap from southern France. Um, but um, it, it is, in fact, it's very near one of those hill forts, the Quai de Mayac, um, a very um, important site in southern France. And you can see now it's um, a wine-growing area. Well, there was a certain amount of wine gr uh, grown in this area in the, um, this Roman interface period, but not very much. Um, a, a lot of wine was, however, grown around Marseille. And what the French archaeologists excavating these sites have been able to do is by um, excavating a good stratigraphical sequence in some of these sites and by counting pot shards... Um, by recognizing the different sorts of amphorae in which the wine was imported, they've been able to build up a very, very interesting picture of how the, the wine-drinking profile of the community changed with time. Next, please. Um, this is the sort of raw material which we're dealing with. Uh, these are just a, this is just a collection of amphorae from the museum in Marseille. Some of them, like these, are local massiliate amphorae, um, very readily recognizable, local wine. Others like these, uh, Dressel 1A amphorae they're called, and we'll come up against those again later, were made, manufactured in uh, central and northern Italy on the east coast and represent the transport of Roman Italian wine into what uh, was still a barbarian area. So that by, counting pot, by recognizing the form, by counting pot shards, by looking at it stratigraphically and statistically, one can begin to see the changing patterns of wine drinking. Next, please. Um, and uh, here is exactly uh, those changing patterns. Will this sharpen just a little? I think it's just a slightly out of focus. Thank you. Um, now, what we're looking at is time going that way. And here are the local amphorae. And here are the Italian amphorae. And I think it, it's um, self-evident that what happens is that the local amphorae uh, decline dramatically uh, as Italian wine drinking becomes more and more popular with time. Uh, there is a complete change in the wine drinking habits of these people um, shunning local wine and taking on Italian wine. Uh, there is another statistic interesting here. Uh, this little line here, which represents gross white rot wine drinking, where you're measuring amphora shards against other pottery, and you see their wine drinking was m moderate for a long while, until about the 120s or 130s, when suddenly there is a great upsurge in wine drinking. And, of course, this represents or reflects exactly what was happening historically to the area, because this is the point up here when um, Rome was engaged in wars in Spain, the Roman armies were going backwards and forwards through this area and gradually opening it up. It was before it became a province, but the Roman entrepreneurs were, in the wake of the army, were seeing here was a ready market and were beginning to flood it with Italian products. Uh, and this, this crucial point here uh, is the point at which the uh, southern French area was actually physically taken over by Rome militarily and became the first Roman province, uh, the province of Transalpina, uh, the Provincia or Provence uh, as we now know it. Um, so you've got two major bits of history recorded in this wine drinking profile. And, and what it shows us basically is that um, there is a, a softening up period in the province, in, in this zone, when Roman wine, um, Roman entrepreneurs are just exploiting the markets before 
the um, province before the area becomes a Roman province when they have complete monopoly of, of control. Next, please. Now, uh, the French archaeologists are doing some extremely exciting work um, off the coast of France um, and are examining um, wrecks which were used to transport the wine. This is uh, one of the wrecks, uh, an underwater shot of the Madrag de Gien, one of the, the famous wrecks, uh, in which you can see the timbers of the boats and these Dressel 1A wine amphorae still stacked. And the importance of wrecks like this is that it is now possible to, um, on, based on the, the size of the ship and the way in which the amphorae are stacked, to estimate um, the carrying capacity of every ship. Um, next, please. And when you look at, um, I'm sorry, there's quite a lot of statistics at this point, but they are interesting. When you look at the number of wrecks, this is the number of wrecks along the French coast, you see that in this um, interface period which concerns us, the number of wrecks are, dram are quite dramatic and then decline. Well, admittedly, one could explain that in a number of ways. It could be that the sailors were just getting rather more proficient um, or that they weren't drinking so much of their cargo or something like that. Um, or it could represent, which most people think, simply um, a reflection of the bulk of wine going in at this time that in this interface period, a tremendous amount of wine was just being thrust into this new market. And uh, some French archaeologists um, have made estimates, that, I think guesstimate is, is a fairer phrase, uh, of the sheer volume of wine, uh, talking of, um, in the hundred years that concerns us, something like 40 million amphorae of wine going in. And um, that, that doesn't perhaps mean too much, but... Um, it compares in sheer volume um, quite favorably with the 14th century wine trade between France and uh, Britain and the Low Countries. Uh, it's a significant fraction of that colossal wine trade. So in other words, the wine trade was a very, very major um, industry at this stage. Next, please. Now, let, let's think of, of why. We've seen it now in southern France. Um, it is manifest in these amphorae. Now, where was it coming from? Well, uh, this is um, just a, a simple distribution map of one type of amphora stamped with the name Cestius. And these are known from the very important excavations at Cursa. And uh, uh, we, we would, some of us were discussing these excavations today. Um, uh, the important work on the Cursa port is to be published by Princeton uh, sometime next year. And that will undoubtedly revolutionize our understanding of the Roman production end of this trade. But to put it very simply, and perhaps over simply in its context, in the Republican period in Rome, uh, the entrepreneurs, the aristocrats, were investing capital in land and in the productive capacity of that land. And many of them were indulging in a monoculture, um, producing some commodities, particularly wine, in vast quantity for export. And therefore, uh, they, they or their, their middlemen, their shippers, were very keen to develop markets like the South French market. Um, and what we see in this simple distribution map is presumably the products of the estates, and some of them have been excavated. Some of them, Sete Fenestri is a great villa uh, excavated just inland from Cosa, a wine-producing villa where you can actually estimate the amount of wine produced in any one vintage. Um, that these great wine-producing estates are in the Cosa area were gearing themselves entirely to the French market. Um, they were not trying to export to the rest of Italy or to the islands or anywhere else uh, they saw France as their market, and it was there that they were spot marketing their commodity of wine. Next, please. Now, the, the question that we must ask is, um, what were they getting back? If you're pouring wine in enormous quantity into a barbarian area, there must be some return for the shippers. And one of the commodities um, which was coming back, undoubtedly, was metals, Metals from the Montagne Noire, this is merely another holiday snap of the Montagne Noire um, in southern France, 
um, uh, and forget the medieval castle. Uh, it's all the pockmarking down from the medieval castle that is relevant, which is a metalworking area, uh, mainly Roman, but that goes back to the pre-Roman period. Enormous quantities of copper were coming out, uh, and some silver, were coming out of these mountains, um, and no doubt um, being exchanged for wine. Next, please. And if you look at the distribution of copper sources, the ones we were talking about were up here. You see there were lots of good copper sources in the Pyrenees and in the Montagnoir, and it's just those areas that these early amphorae uh, are going into and are accumulating in. So here is clear archaeological evidence of metals for wine in the barbarian fringe. Now, one of the other commodities, uh, undoubtedly, um, that was being exchanged was slaves. Um, we must remember that the Roman um, Empire, oh, it wasn't an, an empire then, but the Roman world, uh, was a slave-consuming society. It was a raw material consuming and slave consuming society and one estimate um, that has been put forward on perfectly sound grounds was that Rome consumed about 15,000 Gaulish slaves every year in addition to slaves from elsewhere about 15,000 needed to produ be produced in any one year to satisfy the market um, so that um, if one was dealing with a barbarian fringe uh, one could quite legitimately um, exchange the commodity you had, wine, and get back the commodity you want, wanted, which was slaves. And if I can um, see to... Um, yes, if I can just read you a quotation here, we actually have, from the words from the pen of Diodorus Siculus, a writer writing in the first century, um, an exchange of this kind. He says, um, being, talking of the Celts, he says... Being inordinately fond of wine, they gulp... Uh, I just have to go to the right. Um, being inordinately... Uh, you can't hear me now. <laughs> um, being inordinately fond of wine, they gulp down what the merchants bring them quite undiluted. They have a furious passion for drinking, uh, and they get altogether beyond themselves, being so drunk that they fall asleep or lose their wits. Many Italian merchants prompted by their usual avarice, consequently regard the Gauls' taste for wine as a godsend. Uh, they take the wine to them in ships up the navigable rivers or by carts traveling overland, and it fetches incredible prices. For one amphora of wine, they receive one slave, thus exchanging the drink for the cup-bearer. Now, um, that's a, a nice twist. No, that's okay now. Finish Thanks. Uh, that, 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 that's just a nice twist on it, but um, it, it's a fascinating insight because if you went to the market in Rome, uh, you would be able for an amphora, uh, for a slave, a slave would cost you six or seven amphorae of wine. So what the merchants were able to do on the barbarian fringe was to get their slave remarkably cheaply and make a six times markup by the time it got to the Roman market which isn't a bad profit to make. And the way they could do this, presumably, is by cashing in on the kind of Celtic um, society which they came up against. Because there is a fair amount of evidence that Celtic society at this stage was um, a society practicing a kind of potlatch economy, um, the kind of economy which required conspicuous consumption, uh, conspicuous destruction, conspicuous gift, um, to enable you to maintain status. And presumably what the Roman entrepreneurs were doing was coming up against this Celtic society and was uh, making a gift, an amphora of wine, and the Celt had to respond by making an even more valuable gift, which was the slave. And hence the Roman entrepreneur um, manipulated native customs to his own benefit, exactly as Diodorus Siculus tells us. So um, here we see the age-old pattern of um, a, Ro a Roman or indeed any um, a capitalist entrepreneur uh, manipulating the society, the barbarian society with which he is dealing to his own interests. Next please. 
Now, um, let's explore uh, one aspect of this trade, which is an aspect that I'm involved in, in studying, and I can show you some of the archaeology of it. I described earlier the old trade route, um, the tin trade from Marseille um, across to Toulouse, along the Garonne, the Gironde, the sea trip around Brittany and hitting Britain. Um, when the Romans moved in to the, um, what was to become Transalpina into southern Gaul, um, we know that Scipio was very keen to try and learn something about this trade. And we're told that he asked the uh, merchants at Marseille and the merchants at Narbonne uh, something about these trading routes, something about these old trade ports, uh, and they could tell him nothing, we're told. Uh, presumably, presumably, they would tell him nothing. They were protecting their, their specialist knowledge of the Atlantic trade. A little bit later, about 90, uh, Publius Crassus, uh, we learn, uh, actually shadowed a number of uh, traders along the Atlantic and tried to, to follow the trade routes, tried to follow them to explore their trade routes, and they kept on trying to give in the slip. It was a rather interesting example. And in the end, he did work out the trade routes, he did suss them out, and he went back and announced them to the Roman world. So here, then, we've got clear evidence of the Romans trying to find out how the natives were trading along these Atlantic coasts. And this um, is a distribution of the Dressel wine amphorae, uh, these first century wine amphorae, of the kind produced in Cosa, of the kind that we saw going into southern Gaul, and we can see them uh, going in great quantities um, into the barbarian areas, presumably local shippers, uh, were carting them off to these barbarian markets. And let's explore now a little bit about the, the trade through Brittany and into southern Britain. Next, please. Um, the, there are two types of amphorae, I should say. Um, uh, dress, uh, we know, no need to go into the detail, but Dressel 1A and Dressel 1B, and they're slightly different. The importance is they are chronologically different. And uh, Dressel 1A... Uh, really fits in the first half of the first century BC. And um, what we can find is that the Dressel 1A amphorae predominate in Brittany and in central southern Britain here. And they represent the earliest wine trade hitting Britain. Nearly all of these spots on the map here are these early wine amphorae. 70% of the spots on the map in Brittany are these early ones. So, uh, quite clearly, the early trade is incorporating Brittany, Normandy, the Channel Islands, and hitting central southern Britain. Next, please. And it's possible to look at um, places like the ports um, in Brittany. Oh, could I go back to the last slide? Is that possible? Thank you. Um, ports like Camper, which is down here in Finisterre. Ports like Saint-Malo, saint Servin. Uh, up here in the Côte du Nord, and a port like Hengisbury Head, which is over here in, in Britain. And I just want to show you very briefly the archaeology of those three. Next, please. Um, this is Camper uh, on a good inlet from the sea, um, and uh, I, I won't go into the detail, but uh, underneath modern Camper and underneath Roman Camper, we can recognize at this moment when the traders move in a trading port of some size develops, uh, industrial development in terms of iron production and so on. Next, please. Uh, Saint-Malo, this is a, a slightly difficult to see, but um, a little bit sharp. Thank you. Uh, this is, for anyone who's sailed in this area or has taken the ferry across, Saint-Malo is the very fine medieval and later city there, great pirate center, a scourge of the British sailors, uh, and here is the um, Iron Age precursor uh, on a promontory jutting out into the river Rens, um, marvelously sited for protection and for maintaining control of these cross-channel routes, exactly as its medieval successor is. And now Brittany Ferries, which links Britain to Brittany, still uses the same port. You can't keep a good port down, basically. Next, please. And uh, here the French archaeologists have found on this promontory 
um, areas of Iron Age occupation. It's mutilated now by 18th century forts, by Second World War fortifications. Um, it was a, a site of a, a, a vicious battle in the, at the end of the Second World War when the, the Germans held out here and the American army bombarded them. Uh, and eventually uh, got the Germans out of this stronghold. And even now, there are these great Second World War gun emplacements with shell holes in them. It's a vivid reminder, again, of the, the strength of this site. Next, please. Well, um, Hengisbury Head is the one we know most about, and it's in central southern Britain, beautifully sited. Uh, it's a headland here, jutting out into the sea, it's a headland that you can see for miles around if you're sailing. And much more important, it's got this very well-protected harbor behind it and two rivers that lead up right into the heartland of central southern Britain, the productive part of central southern Britain. So it's an ab absolute gift as a port. And it was here that the early traders settled uh, and developed a major trading port the first trading port uh, in Britain to actually experience Italian wine coming in. And needless to say, in fundraising, I, I tried very hard to make good use of this, this fact and wrote to one of our prime Roman, uh, Italian wine importers now in Britain and uh, said, I'm sure you'll be terribly interested that we are excavating the first place where Italian wine came into Britain and how about a donation to the excavation? <coughs> And uh, they wrote back a, a charming letter saying, well, I'm afraid we don't have money to give for this sort of thing, but here are four or five crates of wine to enjoy it. So um, needless to say, we did. Um, a, a nice link with the past. Next, please. Now, uh, the, the site is, I, I won't bore you with the archaeology of the site, but it, it's a congenial place on the sea, as you see, literally on the sea. Uh, and uh, the archaeology consists of finding circular buildings and buildings built of timbers, all of which have rotted, uh, and finding masses of occupation debris, which represents the, the port and the activities uh, at that port. Next, please. I can just show you a few things. There are our Dressel 1A amphorae, uh, made in Italy and having found their way right across Europe to this obscure part, a barbarian part of the British coast, somewhere between 100 BC and 50 BC. Next, please. And all sorts of other commodities were coming in. These are two crude lumps of purple glass. Um, small lumps, in fact, we find bigger lumps of glass metal, manganese glass metal being brought in. No doubt all these cargoes were mixed cargoes, and they were bringing in luxury objects like glass, which was actually on the site um, these are three ex examples of a bead and two bracelets uh, turned, manufactured into consumer durables, uh, which were then traded to the natives. Exactly the sort of thing one would find in any trading port in Africa in the 18th or 19th century. Uh, you wouldn't find the wine amphorae, you'd find the gin and scotch bottles and the glass beads, of course. Next, please. And then uh, exotic pottery coming in, uh, enabling us to trace the lines of communication. This is pottery, uh, wheel-made pottery, quite unlike anything that uh, had occurred in Britain up to this date. Um, we analyze the fabrics, and it is made in France. Next, please. Here is more exotic pottery, in this case, painted with, uh, with um, graphite to give it this metallic sheen. You can see the graphite painting very clearly there and there. Again, a French product. Next, please. And if one looks at the distribution of those pots, um, here is the area in which they were made. The fabric of the pottery contains minerals found in this area of Brittany. There is uh, Saint-Servin, the um, port near Saint-Malo, where the pots occur in great quantity. And here are the stopping off points on the Channel Islands, uh, which the sailors used as they... Uh, made their way across, through the islands, island hopping, across to Hengisbury Head. And there at Hengisbury is a great quantity of it. So from Hengisbury alone, we can recognize the Roman wine amphorae coming from far afield, the exotic glass coming from far afield, and then these French pots 
no doubt, bulking up the cargo uh, in the short-haul traffic, the last haul of the trade across the barbarian market. Next, please. And what were they getting back? Again, we must always ask this. What was the reciprocal nature of the trade? Well, Strabo, writing a bit later, writing in the first century, uh, later in the first century, um, tells us that the products of Britain were metals, wheat, uh, hides, hunting dogs, and slaves. And those were the commodities which the Roman world wanted. Uh, in an interesting range, again, raw materials, uh, hides one suspects needed for the army, um, and uh, wheat, of course, needed uh, to feed the army, the metals, the slaves needed for manpower, uh, and the hunting dogs, well, uh, the Romans were always rather keen to uh, import exotic animals uh, for, for use in the chase or for use in the arena. Um, so here are the products from barbarian Britain, um, which were passing through France, through these trade routes, into the Mediterranean consuming world. And um, without going into a great deal of detail, we're able to trace the contact zone in Britain, which would produce certainly the um, the wheat in great quantity, and then the zones beyond, uh, a cattle-producing zone down here, which we know of from other archaeological evidence, um, metal-producing zones there and here and here. And there is actually at Hengisbury a great slab, a huge slab of silver-rich copper, um, which has trace elements which tell us that it comes from uh, this, this river here. So we've got commodities being collected from all the way around Britain, the mineral-rich southwest, the productive center south, the food productive center south, and presumably beyond this, the slave-producing barbarian inland, and all being channeled down. No doubt, no doubt, dislocating native society in a way it had never previously experienced. And as a model for this, one needs only look at what was happening in West Africa at the moment when the slave trade hit it in the 18th uh, and early 19th centuries to see how a primitive economy uh, completely reoriented itself to being a slave-producing economy and endemic warfare, which was a part of the social system, uh, became the norm, uh, warfare for getting slaves. And there is ample evidence in Britain, I think, to suggest that this is exactly what is happening at this stage, that uh, no doubt there was slavery before. But from now on, once the slave becomes a marketable commodity, uh, something that you can sell for great profit, then your society reorients itself to become a slave raiding, a slave cropping society. And uh, when Roman writers look in on Britain, uh, they see it in a state of uh, turmoil and warfare. And I suggest that this was the result, ultimately, um, uh, the direct result of this trade that we've been talking about. Next, please. Well, um, to finish the story, and I can do this fairly quickly, um, the, this trade that I was talking about, first half of first century AD, was short-lived for the simple reason uh, that in the 50s, between 60 and 50, in fact, uh, BC, Caesar moved into Gaul and took over Gaul. And Gaul became a Roman province. And this caused a complete reorientation of the trade. These rather long, old-established Atlantic routes were no longer of any use. Uh, they were too long, too cumbersome. And it was possible to trade directly with the river mouths over here of the Seine and, and the, upwards the Rhine uh, and eastern Britain. And it's in eastern Britain that we find the later amphorae concentrating and all the rich burials. Next, please. Um, things like uh, this burial. It's an old illustration of the burial from Wellin where we find um, uh, quite fine... Um, Pots probably imported, and this, these um, wine strainers from northern Italy. Wine drinking equipment um, transshipped to the barbarians of Britain and used here as part of a status burial. Next, please. A little bit later, 
we find really exotic things coming in. This is Augustan uh, Italian, North Italian Augustan silver. Uh, wine drinking, again, silver cups, uh, which would be part of the wine drinking ritual. And these were imported through middlemen into barbarian Eastern Britain and found their way into the hands of the British middlemen who could command the trade with Rome. Next, please. And they found their way into burials like this one. This is right on the eve of the Roman conquest, somewhere around 43 AD, 40, 40, about 40 AD. Uh, Roman conquest was 43 AD in Britain, where we have the uh, beer um, of, upon which the dead man was laid, uh, his cremated ashes, uh, and his wine-drinking equipment. Uh, three or four amphorae, presumably full of wine, Italian wine, bronze bowls, and cups uh, for drinking it. The entire wine-drinking equipment, much as uh, when um, Chinese tea-drinking became uh, the norm in, in, in Europe. Uh, so all the, all the accoutrements, the teapot, the teacups, and all the rest of it, were introduced along with the, the beverage. So here we get the, the wine-drinking equipment coming in um, with, with the wine and finding its way into these few rich burials. Next, please. Now, um, if you'll allow me just this one diagram to explain uh, what I think was happening... Uh, we have the, uh, it's, it's partly geographical. We have the Roman world here now of Gaul, of France, uh, which um, is part, becomes part of the Roman consumer market. Um, in central southern, uh, in, in southeastern Britain, we have um, the centralized power of a number of dynasts, rulers who we can recognize and name through their coinage. They were issuing coins. And around the periphery of the territory, concentrate these very rich burials. And they were uh, trading with a number of um, tribal groups, the names of which we have, all coin issuing, uh, so we can recognize them uh, distributionally. Uh, and beyond them, beyond this periphery, um, we have uh, the beyond, the barbarians beyond. And I think in Britain we have this picture very clearly stated of uh, raw materials coming from the barbarian areas, passing through one kind of tribal middleman into the hands of the real uh, native entrepreneurs here who were able to acquire Roman luxury goods in return and then passing into the Roman consumer market. All, of course, long before the Romans arrived in Britain. This is what I mean by the bow wave effect of Romanization. Next, please. Now, um, oh no, I'll skip that one. Next, please. Now, if we just summarize in three or four slides, um, then I make my final point. Um, we go back to where I started with uh, somewhere about the, in the 5th century, 5th, uh, century, 6th, 5th century BC, with this very small classical fringe on the Mediterranean, um, and with our natives growing rich with their prestige goods economy, the great Vix Crater, and all the great luxury objects in barbarian Gaul here. Um, the trade routes recognizable. Next, please. Then somewhere about between 100 and 60 BC, uh, Rome is cross-hatched. Rome has expanded its influence, uh, expanded its influence into southern Gaul, and we find around the Roman influence, state formation, the natives beginning to take on Roman patterns of, of government, uh, Roman patterns of urban life, and beyond them, the natives uh, getting rich, um, burying luxury goods in their, um, in their graves. This penumbra of prestige goods. Next, please. When we come on a little bit further, and Rome, uh, somewhere between up to about 43 AD, Rome has now pushed to the Rhine on the one hand and the, uh, the, the Danube, up to the Rhine-Danube frontier. We see that situation which I summarized in Britain with the trade with Britain and now the middlemen who are able to indulge in this rich burial of luxury goods, wine-drinking goods, uh, move to southeastern Britain 
and they are manipulating this area. Next, please. Um, but it doesn't quite end there. Because when Rome moves to Britain, when it consolidates its, its frontier here, let us say by 200 AD, by which time things were uh, fairly stable in the Roman world, we find again, uh, in advance of the, the frontier zone, about 200, meet, uh, 200 meters, kilometers from it, um, again, an area of prestige goods economy. Uh, this time, North European plains spreading into Scandinavia. And exactly the same pattern of prestige goods. Next, please. Here, a, Rome, a, sec a first century, in fact, AD, Roman wine drinking jug uh, from Denmark. Next, please. And in about 200 AD, um, this Roman wine drinking set from a grave in Sweden. So, this sort of same pattern we can see repeated time and time again as the Roman frontier moves, uh, so the, the economic pattern in advance of that Roman frontier moves, and we've been able to trace it from somewhere about 600 BC uh, up to here uh, 200 AD. And then, of course, the whole thing collapsed with the, the end of, of the Roman world and the Roman economic system. Now, if I've been um, slightly harsh on the Romans um, and presented them as exploiters and entrepreneurs, um, it's because this surely is what they were. It's not to um, uh, argue that this was a particularly bad thing. Um, and they used, I think, this economic system of softening up the natives uh, as a prelude always to conquest. And I think in any part of the Roman world, we can trace this same fascinating pattern. Um, I don't think the Romans are wholly bad at all. I hope I haven't given that impression. I've perhaps uh, tended to take the side of the Celt. Um, but uh, there, was, there is a Roman graffito of the 4th century AD, which uh, I'd like to leave you with, um, scribbled on a wall. It's anonymous, as all good graffiti are, uh, is the phrase... Um, Wine, women, and baths corrupt our bodies, but these things make life itself. And any society that says that can't be wholly bad. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
Oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, can I take them one at a time? Uh, uh, you're asking, first of all, what um, a fibula is. Uh, it, 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 I shouldn't have used the word. It's simply a jargon, jargon phrase for a kind of safety pin brooch. A particular kind of brooch, which is extremely useful archaeologically because um, brooches change, the fashion changes fast. Uh, and there were regional styles, um, and um, some fibulae uh, were um, made in particular areas to a regional style, um, so that uh, it's possible by just looking at them to say more or less what date they are and more or less uh, where they came from if they're, they're foreign. That, that was your first question. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think we, some of my colleagues who study the Neolithic period in Europe, in Western Europe, uh, would argue that they can see elements of conspicuous consumption uh, and the, the annual, the, well, the, the, the periodic meetings um, actually in the Neolithic period. But I, I, I wouldn't go quite so far as that. I think we can see it very, very clearly in um, Celtic society. Um, for example, if I may give you uh, an example from the Irish literature, which um, is this uh, marvelous set of, of oral traditions, Celtic traditions, uh, which were maintained in Ireland until the 8th and 9th century AD, when they were eventually written down uh, by, by Christian scribes. Uh, they were emasculated and written down, but enough of them comes over. Um, we see in these uh, traditions and uh, heroic stories the, the, the potlatch coming over very, very clearly. Uh, the need, um, particularly feast, and um, gaining status uh, through feast. Uh, the care with which one has to prepare the house in which the feast takes place, um, send out invitations a year in advance, bolster it into the happening of the year, um, produce the richest, the best, everything, uh, then invite people to it. And in doing that, you gain the most colossal status. And this is actually explicit in, in the Celtic literature. And I think it's that that we see rather more dimly reflected, but absolutely clearly there, um, in the classical writers writing about the Celts in the 3rd and 2nd and 1st centuries BC in Europe. It's the same tradition. So I would say that um, uh, archaeologically and historically, we can see it clearly at that time. And there is no reason to suppose it didn't extend over most of Europe. Uh, and there is no reason to suppose um, that it wasn't a normal part of that kind of heroic society, which we can trace back at least into the Bronze Age, uh, if not before, in Europe. So it's very old established. I think, um, uh, I, I, like you, I, I was introduced to the potlatch uh, in studying anthropology and the Nutkar and the Kwakiutl. Uh, those were the, the key example uh, for me as a, a, a young anthropologist studying. Um, and uh, it, it's very interesting to see this as a, a response of a particular kind of society. Um, a, a frequent response, not an invariable response, of a particular kind of society. Um, at a particular stage in its its development and and universal. Uh, yes, please. Uh, yes. Thank you. Yes, uh, the um, question was: um, Is there, do I find any evidence of coinage actually being used for the purchase of wine? Um, there, there certainly, we're dealing with um, the equivalent to a money economy in southern Gaul at this stage. Um, I know of no direct evidence um, apart from uh, a rather uh, late text, uh, the Pro Fonteo, um, when Cicero was defending uh, Fonteus, um, um, who was a pro praetor, um, um, uh, something like a governor of southern Gaul. Um, uh, Cicero was defending him against a charge of embezzlement and, and a number of other things. And uh, incidentally gives us a very interesting insight into the wine trade. He says that um, you know, an, it's all right, an amphora of wine goes into such and such a town. 
and when they pass it, when it passes through the merchants in that town, uh, they charge a denarius or a denarius and a half on it. Then it goes to the next town and they charge another denarius. And all right, so those people are getting rich on this trade, but it doesn't matter. The wine ultimately is going to the natives. So here where it's passing through the, the, the Romanized fringe, we're, we're, we're getting the money economy. But when it goes beyond that, there is no evidence of that. Um, it's arguable when a real money economy uh, came into the Celtic world, uh, some archaeologists would argue that there was no such thing as a market economy uh, in the pre-Roman period. And some of my colleagues, uh, on growing and very interesting grounds, are beginning to argue that there was no proper uh, money economy, even in Roman Britain, throughout most of Roman Britain, uh, that the circulation of coins and the, the volume of coin in use was not sufficient to maintain a full money economy. Uh, but I'm, I'm not proficient to, to talk on this. But um, mo most people um, feel that in this uh, sort of twilight period that we're studying, that all the um, trade was in embedded, it was an embedded economy in an anthropological sense of the word, that um, it was exchange within the social system rather than purchase, outright purchase. Um, although um, I can't help feeling, and I, I have argued, although it's been argued against, that in southeastern England, um, one might begin to see the, uh, a range of coins which could, um, which are the sorts of coins that one might have if one had a money uh, economy uh, as early as uh, the time of Caesar, mid-first century BC, but certainly nothing earlier. There are coins earlier, but they are high-value coins, which are presumably used as gift exchange rather than for um, purchase. Uh, yes, please. Right. The, the question is, is there any evidence of the activity of, of Jewish traders? Um, I think I must say no. There is no positive evidence uh, of it. Um, uh, the... In fact, there is very little evidence of the, of the traders themselves, unfortunately, until one gets right into the Roman period. Uh, it's, it's a pretty anonymous period that we're dealing with, and we have to enliven it through um, looking at stamps on amphorae, uh, as we did. Um, there's a little bit of information um, about the sort of middlemen, uh, the, the mercantile class uh, in Rome, who were manipulating this kind of trade. Uh, in, in, in Rome, but um, when it comes to the, the fringes, uh, no decent evidence at all, I'm afraid. Yes, please. Um, the first question was, uh, were the maps, the white on black, uh, part of a publication? Um, some of them uh, occur in um, uh, several papers that I've written, that uh, one building on another on this theme. Uh, a number of them are not yet published, uh, but will be part of a book, uh, which is uh, very much on this theme. It's, it's, uh, I don't know what it's going to be called, but it's, it, it's just about this, but more than just the wine trade. You, you had another question? Right. The, the question is, um, is there any evidence of, of the drinking equipment that, that goes with the wine in the sort of Hengisbury area and, and in the area around it? <clears throat> it's, it's an extremely interesting question because the answer is there isn't any evidence, and I don't know why. Um, it's puzzling. The sort of thing one would expect to be coming in at this stage are Campanian cups, uh, which are all over France. Um, but there is only one dubious shard in spite of all our hard digging all over England, there's one dodgy shard, although we have a lot of amphorae. But um, could, could I say that um, the, the maps look as though we're dealing with a bulky trade? Um, all the amphorae from Britain could fit into the lower part of one boat. 
um, when we, it's difficult to know what volume we're dealing with. <clears throat> uh, in, in Britain, and um, it, you could take, uh, it's not the view I take, but you could take the minimal view um, that Hengisbury uh, was the site of one boat going in and taking a load of wine in, and that was it. It was a one-off. Um, I, I think there are lots of things one could argue against that. But um, wh why in this, certainly in the later period, after, a hun uh, after 50 BC, there was a lot of wine-drinking paraphernalia going in? wine strainers, wine jugs, cups of, uh, well, the silver ones we saw, but also the ceramic cups, certainly the Aratine and, and um, Terra Nigra cups made in Gaul um, g going in. Um, but in this early period, there are none yet. And um, it may simply be that they were organic vessels or that they were just using local pots. I, I don't know the answer, but it is an extremely interesting question to ask. Yes, please. Yes, well, well, the question is why was Kosa so um, I intent on getting tin and copper and other things? I think I, must, I may have given the wrong impression. Um, Kosa uh, was one of the prime ports through which the product of wine was exported for profit. It doesn't mean to say that the things that were um, coming back were for the use of that area. Indeed, the ships may have been doing um, triangular or multifaceted runs. Um, the sort of thing one could imagine is the ships from um, Kosa taking wine to Marseille and Narbonne and offloading their wine there and taking on board, indeed, any cargo that was available and bringing it back, not necessarily to Kosa, but to Ostia or, or any other port. I think it's a much more complex trade um, than uh, perhaps I may have uh, um, suggested. Um, all we can do is to isolate some of the threads of that trade. Um, but I think if one looks at the sorts of um, slave um, fish trade that was going on between Europe and America and Africa in the 18th and 19th century, uh, the ships were taking on all sorts of things and moving them around. Um, and uh, serving a number of countries and a number of ports. And I think that we've got the um, aristocratic um, monopoly producers, monocultural producers of wine on the one hand, producing this great quantity in league with ship owners and probably with a financial stake in the ships anyway, uh, and um, getting rid of their wine that way and um, uh, bringing back uh, a range of valued commodities. Please. Well, I, I think uh, today um, the, the question is, um, uh, is, was wine used by the Romans as um, really a tool of submission, for submission? And uh, does the graph which I showed of uh, a sudden increase in, in wine drinking reflect that? Well, I, I think um, one can generalize and say yes to that. Uh, it, as, as usual, these things are so much more complex. Um, th there is one, one text which is quite interesting um, about the, the bell guy. Um, the, I think it was Caesar talking about the bell guy uh, who lived in um, northern France and Belgium and were at this stage away from the enervating effects of Roman luxuries. And that's exactly what he said. So Caesar was seeing those tribes who absorbed Roman luxuries as becoming soft. 
whereas those away. Now, to what extent it was deliberate policy, I think it's far more, uh, I, I would prefer, <coughs> excuse me, uh, prefer an explanation in terms of it being um, uh, in, in just in marketing terms, uh, that here was um, a, a, a great new market um, which uh, wanted wine, um, liked wine, uh, drank it in great quantities, as so many classical writers tell us about the Celts, drank it undiluted, we're told. Uh, no self-respecting Roman would drink his wine undiluted, so they, they deserve all they got by drinking it undiluted, was the implication. Um, that um, here was a market, and uh, why not exploit it? And I think it was far more that, rather than a deliberate attempt uh, to soften up. I don't think Roman imperial policy was quite that deliberate. Um, I think once the area uh, around was um, really economically uh, linked to Rome, um, it was just easy to move in and, and conquer it. Uh, it was marginally easier to do that uh, than not to do it. So I think it was rather more that. I'm, I'm oversimplifying. But that graph that I showed, um, uh, taken on its face value, and I think the, the, the data is good, um, does suggest that um, after... Um, the province uh, formally became a part of the Roman Empire, wine drinking did dramatically increase. Yes, I think one can accept that. Uh, but then, um, presumably, what it's showing us is that the wine drinking level of society was way below that of the Roman world. And when it became part of the Roman world, wine consumption went up to an equivalent to the Roman world. I suspect it's that, rather than anything else. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the question is, um, how, how well extensive was the Phoenician involvement in, in the tin trade? Well, um, uh, in terms of the texts that are available to us, the texts imply that it was regular and established. Um, though whether it was Phoenicians all the way is another matter. Um, to what extent it was short-haul trade, um, tin going from Britain to Brittany, and then tin going from Brittany down to the mouth of the um, Loire, and then someone else picking it up in the mouth of the Loire and taking it down still further. Or, what, uh, to, or to what extent it was um, the Phoenicians from southern Spain um, going around Iberia and, and, and right up to Britain, it's difficult to say. But in, in terms of the texts, Phoenician involvement is implied. In terms of the archaeology, there is not a single scrap of evidence, unfortunately. Um, no scrap of anything that looks like a Phoenician pot uh, anywhere in Brittany or Britain. Um, the only evidence that one could use, and that can be argued lots of ways, is that there are um, Mediterranean coins, um, some Phoenician, uh, which are found scattered in the area. But then they, they're all out of context, and they could have come in um, as 18th century AD collections, uh, or uh, in, in the Roman period or in the immediate pre-Roman period. So um, I don't think one can use that. It, it's a very, very interesting problem, but I see no way of designing a piece of archaeology to, to throw further light on it. Um, I'll take one more question, if I may. Uh, yes, please. Uh, yes, the Romans didn't know that uh, when, when they moved in. Um, uh, well, why did they conquer Britain? Um, I think that uh, there, there are lots of reasons. One was a purely political reason that uh, Claudius uh, needed a triumph to establish himself politically uh, in Rome. And um, where better uh, to, uh, uh, to, to gain a triumph than by conquering Britain? It was there, it was virtually Roman anyway. Um, and it was just a matter of, he thought, sending a few uh, you know, legion or two across, and uh, there it was. Uh, but as, as you imply in your question, um, the, the costs of maintaining Britain were, were very heavy indeed. 
And I think it's pretty clear that um, the Romans were thoroughly disappointed once they got here. Uh, and there is some evidence to suggest that during the reign of Nero, they actually thought of getting out. Um, and uh, because um, it's usually, a, uh, um, there were various loans uh, made to Britons, and then in the reign of Nero, those loans were being called in. And it looks as though the entrepreneurs were getting ready to make a quick getaway. Um, and the usual explanation is because uh, they realized that the mineral wealth wasn't all that it was thought to be. Uh, and that the hostile tribes in the mountainous areas were always going to be a nuisance, and it was going to be a very expensive province to maintain. Um, but policy reverted, and, and they, they did stay. Um, but uh, uh, each one of these conquests, I think, has got to be seen in terms of not only the, the broad economics and the broad strategies, but also in the day-to-day the -day ambitions of the individuals, not least the uh, Roman emperor's needs uh, to maintain a standing army, but also to spread that stand, standing army and to keep these generals uh, quite often isolated out of the way so they couldn't be a nuisance in Rome. So there are lots, lots of factors. And it's a very good point to finish on. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.